All right. Good morning. We continue our study in First Kings chapter eight. One of the telltale signs of whether you are serving the Lord or not is how many times you use the pronoun I. <laughs> right? I did this, I did that. Who gets credit? Who gets the glory? <coughs> and one of the things, and, and <coughs> we would pass over this probably when we take a look at this dedication, right before the dedication prayer. If it weren't for the fact of what Solomon's life became, okay, one of the things I always like to <coughs> point out when we talk about David and Bathsheba is how many times through the Psalms he said, my integrity and my righteousness and my... Lest God's getting the glory, we have an ego problem. And so let's take a look at this statement of dedication before his prayer de de uh, of dedication. First Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 14, he says, And then the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to my father David, and with his hand has fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I, w I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in, in which to build a house, that my name might be there, but I chose David to be over my people Israel." Now it was in the heart of my David to build a uh, temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son it will come from your body. He shall build the temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, and I have fulfilled, I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel. As the Lord promised, and I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel, and there I have made a place for the ark in which is uh, in the covenant of the Lord which he made our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now Solomon gives an accurate summary of history. By the way, you'll notice this all the way through Hebrew literature is they don't say what's happening. They go all the way back to the beginning. He knows every time they tell a story, where do they have to start? All the way back, coming across Egypt, and out of the land, everything else. And the Psalms, same thing. If they're going to praise the Lord, they're going all the way back. To, so they have to do that. We see this in the New Testament as well. Stephen, where does he start? All the way back to Abraham. He goes all the way through the history. Acts chapter 22, where does Paul start? He goes all the way back in the history. And so they, they, they link all these things together. So in typical Jewish fashion, Solomon goes back throughout the history, brings events forward to the present time of the speaker. Now God brought Israel out of Egypt. This is the starting point of the nation of Israel. Everything, you have two starting points for Israel. One, of course, Abraham, right? That's where it starts. But the second, everything seems to start right there as the Exodus, because they, really, they were a people, but they weren't a nation yet, right? So when they come out, now we got a nation. So everything, you know, God brings them out, and everything starts as coming across Sinai and coming across as a nation. And so God receives credit here for the exit. God brought my people out. And by the way, this is a, a quotation out of the book of Exodus and out of Deuteronomy. He's quoting what God says, I have done. 
Uh, God had a singular purpose in bringing Israel out to make a people for who? For himself, right? These are going to be my people. They're going to, it's going to be a covenant with the people. They're to worship me. I'm going to be their God, and, and they're going to be my people. That's what he's going to do. Now, several pertinent points he makes in the summary. First of all, for centuries, God had directed Israel to carry the tabernacle, but not to build a temple. We're talking about this tabernacle, this tent, which I'm sure they've replaced a few parts over the years. For four centuries, they're carrying this tent around. And in the wilderness, it moved many times. And we at least have three moves in after they get into the land. So this tabernacle is a tent. So God's dwelling in this tent. And God brought them out of, of Egypt, and now they're carrying this tabernacle. And God says, listen, I haven't, I haven't asked you to build a temple. You know. So when God chose David to be king, David says, okay, now that I've been established and now that you promised that I'm going to have descendants on the throne forever, uh, now I want to build a temple. And God says, that, that's good, but you're not going to build a temple because you're a what? You're a bloody man. Literally in the Hebrew, you're a man of blood. A uh, lot of fighting and a lot of blood. Says, so you're not going to build a temple. It's going to be a man of peace. Your son's going to build a temple. Someone that comes from your body is going to build the temple for me. So David did the next best thing and just collected a lot of material for the temple. And so David desired to build a temple. God didn't allow it. God promised that David's son would build a temple. And Solomon fulfilled that promise. And this was the day of dedication. This is one of the red letter days on the calendar just like tomorrow is a red letter day in the history of our nation right the fourth of july and uh by the way the fourth of july is a signing day they actually voted on july the what the, the july the second to do this but they had to get back from the printers you know it wasn't they couldn't go down to staples yes what's that Oh, okay, we've got back at there. Yeah, okay. All right, there you go. Okay, thank you for that. And so, so it, it comes, you know, by the way, that, this is just a side note. It has nothing to do with this message here. You know, we celebrate June, uh, Juneteenth, right? 19th, you know, the last slaves here. Well, actually, not all the slaves were free until December the 6th, 1865, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. The border states of Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, the slaves were not free because the slaves in emancipation were only free in the rebel-held states. So the actual Emancipation Day is December the 6th of 1865 with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. That's just a, that's just, that was a commercial. That's just a side note. <laughs> you know? And so some things aren't always what they seem to be. And so the, the Ark of the Covenant... I uh, was now in a permanent home in Jerusalem. And by the way, I, as I mentioned last week, this plays into the end times because if there were a tabernacle still, it could move anywhere, right? A tabernacle could move all over the place, but the temple had to stay exactly in the spot it was built. And of course, there's a mosque there today. <laughs> and so for the temple to be rebuilt, something's got to be done with this mosque. Now, God accomplished his will for his purpose for Israel to exalt his holy name. Now, there's a hint of self-exaltation here. As I say, we wouldn't even notice this, I don't think, if it were not for the fact that Solomon end up glorifying himself, collecting things, collecting wives, building palaces, everything else afterwards. But you have a subtle hint here. In two verses, he uses the pronoun I three times. Solomon used the pronoun I, saying, I, for, I filled the position on my father David. I built the temple for his name. I made a place for the ark. Interesting. Did Solomon do that by himself? 
Matter of fact, how many, how many stones or, uh, or uh, pieces of wood did uh, Solomon himself lay? <laughs> Probably like zero, right? Okay, who's the one that gave him peace and the material to do this? Who's the one that gave him the resources? It was God, okay? He said, I built the temple. I fulfilled, I filled the position of my father David. I placed the ark in here. So Solomon could have meant that God used him to accomplish that, but that's not what he says. Nor does he say, for the praise of the glory that the Lord allowed me to do this. Matter of fact, uh, one of the greatest verses in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 1.29. It says, no flesh shall glory in my presence. No flesh shall glory in my presence. God has to get the praise. Matter of fact, that's what Paul later on in that book said in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. He says, why do you brag as if the things that you've been given haven't been received? In other words, you're not the one that gave your intelligence. You're not the one that gave your ability. You're not the one that gave you these opportunities. And so there's a contrast between Moses' statement Shall we bring water out of this rock? Well, can Moses bring water out of the rock? Absolutely not. Did Moses open the Red Sea? No, it was God that opened the Red Sea. He used Moses as an instrument, but he had no power. There's a contrast between that and Joseph and Daniel. You know, Nebuchadnezzar asked if Daniel could interpret the dream. He says, I can't interpret any dreams. However, what? God can interpret your dream. And so Daniel was able to give the interpretation and give God the credit for it. Joseph said the same thing. He says, oh, Pharaoh, no man can interpret your dream or tell you what it was, but God can, and God shall reveal it to you. And, of course, that's when he did the seven years of, uh, of plenty followed by seven years of famine. So... Notice the contrast between Solomon saying, I built the temple. I put the ark in the Holy of Holies. Versus, you know, Joseph and Daniel say, no, no, we, we can't take credit for any of this. Only the Lord can take credit for this. Now, there's several points of God using power alone. Elijah could not bring fire down from heaven on his own. There were four times, or actually three times, that Elijah called fire down from heaven once at Mount Carmel and twice when he wiped out the 50 men coming to arrest him each time. The third guy says, oh, oh, please, <laughs> you know, please hold my life precious and the life of my men. Would you please come? Different attitude, right? Uh, Paul could not heal on his own, right? Paul can only heal people who... The Lord pointed to. He couldn't even heal the thorn in his own flesh. Or Trophimus, who he left to Troas because he was very sick. Or Epaphroditus, who said he was sick almost near death. Unless the Lord told him, I want you to heal this person, reach out your hand, he couldn't do it. And so when something is accomplished, we need to give God the credit to allow us to be a part of what he was doing, what he is involved in, what he allowed us to do, none of the credit goes to us. If we are used of God, our only credit would be the fact that we obeyed God and what God was doing, okay? And matter of fact, it says over in Exodus 4, it says, you know, Moses, who's made man's mouth? Who's made the dumb dumb and the lame lame? It is I, the Lord, that raises up and brings down. See, the Lord, none of, these, none of these things happen unless the Lord gives permission for them to happen. And so, and besides that, Mr. Solomon, it took a lot of people to build that temple. It took a lot of people right, to carve the stone. It took a lot of people to bring down the wood. It took a lot of people to put all this together. And you say, I did this? I did that? No, no, Solomon the Lord allowed you 
to be able to lead this project, but the Lord must get the glory. So by not publicly giving God credit for the building of the temple, Solomon demonstrates a character flaw. And as I say, had he served righteously throughout his thing, we wouldn't even notice this. But you notice this, like for example, when you go to the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, it says Solomon loved many women. <laughs> but what does that really mean? Well, he lusted after many young, pretty virgins. And 700 wives may be a little bit overkill, don't you think? <laughs> and 300 concubines, a little bit overkill. Yay! <laughs> oh, fantastic. We'll go call you up later on in the morning service with a new baby here. It's wonderful. Just stole the show here. Okay. And so, uh, and Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is one of the great passages of the Old Testament. It says, he says, Israel, is, I'm the one that gives you the power to gain wealth. I'm the one that gives you the power to grow crops. I'm the one that gives you the, it is I the Lord. If it were not for me, you couldn't do any of this. And so we have to keep in mind, if the Lord has given you a uh, nice job and a nice house and transportation, it's him. You know, you might have followed right. You might have been used by the Lord, but without the Lord. I met a lot of people when I was overseas Smart, intelligent, everything, but not does not have the opportunity we have. It's God that gives you that. It's the God that opens that up for you. And so, uh, so He is the one. We can't boast of anything, uh, <clears throat> but in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, that's why in First Corinthians ten thirty one we have the passage: whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do what? All to the glory of God. <laughs> I mean, even the simplest things, God's the one that allows you to have the food <laughs> or the clothing, you know, or just the intelligence. It's all to God's glory that he might be, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, all in all. Paul was beginning to forget that. So God sent a what? Thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that it remind, remind him that he was just a man after all, right? And so the signs of, here are the signs of pride. Then we'll have our, our discussion this morning. First of all, glorying in accomplishments. We see this Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, what a great kingdom of Babylon I have built. <laughs> and the Lord struck him with what uh, is known technically in medical terms, labiomania. He went out of his mind. <laughs> he thought he was an animal. Coveting someone else's place. We see this with King Uzziah. He decided, the king's being pretty good, but I'd like to also be a priest and sacrifice. And he went into the te temple to sacrifice, and God struck him down with lepers. <laughs> uh, the overuse of the pronoun I. I remember someone calling, and you know, he was telling me how great he's, you know, servant of God he was. And, and I ticked off, I says, after he finally took a breath, I said, do you realize you just said the word I 28 times? <laughs> now, he didn't take that very well. He went on with his life. Later on, he apologized. I said, I understand now what you mean. It's not about I, 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 right? <laughs> I understand, I understand. That's right, I understand what you mean. I, 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 you know. Uh, Taking credit, uh, we see this with Herod, Acts chapter 12. This is Herod Agrippa II. He stands up and they say, oh, it's a God speaking, it's a God speaking. And he took credit for that, you know. And it said, God struck him down. And matter of fact, Luke, the physician, says he was eaten for three days by worms from the inside, which probably would not have been a very pleasant way to... <laughs> exactly, yeah, sure. That would not be a pleasant way to go, you know. And so, uh, abuse of our gifts, Samson. How many of you here think Samson was a big show off? <laughs> yeah, you know, instead of giving God the glory, you know, you know, he, he put, matter of fact, remember the poem he wrote about himself after killing all those Philistines? 
you know, swinging it around and killing a thousand and everything. You know, he, you have that in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 where Paul is chastising them for boasting about the gifts God has given them. <laughs> All right? Uh, desire to be honored. You had that with Haman, right? Haman wanted everybody to bow down before him in, the, in, in Persia. And Mordecai refused to do that. And you know the whole scenario through the book of Esther, how the Jews were saved. Uh, Cain, same way, right? Cain, uh, why wouldn't you accept the offering I gave you? After all, don't you know I'm Cain? <laughs> you know, and you know he kills Abel. So Solomon may have, th- by the way, this is very important to understand. He may have thought that his motives were pure. Pride can be very, very subtle, can it? You know, this idea of when we feel jealousy or we want to get credit or we want to be up front. Uh, we want people to think that we're something important. It can be very subtle. And I think it was in Solomon's life, it was very subtle that this, this ego, this pride being lifted up and everything else and glorified. And, and, and so we have to realize that pride and jealousy and envy and can be unrecognizable in us. We've got to be very careful about that. Now listen, Solomon had to figure, and and, and I I think he went the wrong way. Was he glorying in the accomplishment of the temple or was he glorying in the God of the temple? There's a difference, isn't there? Matter of fact, you had that hint in the disciples. He says, look at this great building. (laughs) And Jesus says, you know, you see these stones in these buildings? I'm telling you right now, there's going to come a day where what? Not one, one stone will be left on top of the other, and it'll all be burnt. And they were shocked. And then he said something that really blew their mind. He says, I tell you, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, he wasn't talking about <laughs> the building, right? He was talking about the resurrection. I'm going to say something, and, and I don't want this misconstrued. Uh, because a lot of us like some of the teaching preacher John MacArthur, right? And but some of them he's off quite a bit. Well, there was a controversy. He was a member of the IFCA and <coughs> at Limerick Chapel up in Pennsylvania. I mean, he, he sometimes he gets so big as a Christian celebrity, you think what you say is pontification. And he, he had trouble. He wasn't eternally the son. He became the son. He did this, things like this, things like that. And he stood up there, and, and I don't want to, if you're a big MacArthur fan, I don't want to, but he actually stood up and said this. He says, okay, I'm holding here the doctrine of the IFCA. And he lists the seven people on the committee, uh, which included uh, Dr. Freeman, included uh, one of the pastors who's actually up here in New Carrollton, uh, and he listened, and then he threw it down and says, whoever these guys are. He just said it that way. I just said, what? In other words, I'm John MacArthur, whoever these guys are. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't get bigger than Jesus. <laughs> that when we, what we say is coming directly from the throne what we're saying, everything. we've got to be very careful. I remember a statement Tim, Tim Keller said. He said, I never wanted to be a celebrity, you know, because now they're looking to me instead of the Word of God. And that's a very dangerous position to be in. And so Solomon was, at this point, was glorying in the building of the temple. And his prayer is wonderful. But we see the rest of his life that perhaps he was glorying in the temple and not in the God of the temple. Let's pray and we'll have a discussion. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this morning. We just pray, Lord, that you will just uh, honor and, 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 and glorify your holy name in and through us for whatever uh, you want us to do, whatever 
you want us to accomplish, Lord, that be all to your glory and in your name. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray.